All right, everybody, we are back again with a sponsor by Fetch. Fetch is a super easy to use free app where you earn free rewards on literally anything you buy. Scan any physical receipt or e-receipt and you will earn points for every purchase. Even if you have receipts that are up to two weeks old, you can still scan them and start earning points. After you scan, you can redeem those points for hundreds of rewards, including Amazon, Visa, Starbucks, GameStop, Walmart gift cards. Fetch is 100% free and so easy to use. Everyone in the comments honestly always talks about Fetch too. And I, it's like, I have Fetch, I have Fetch, I have Fetch. Well, why wouldn't you? It's basically free money. It's just crazy. I didn't realize how many people use Fetch. I know. Fetch works with literally any retail receipt from anywhere. And we will actually show you guys right now how to scan your receipts. Anything you buy works with Fetch. So you have free range as to what type of receipt you will scan during the integration. You can scan your receipt, redeem points, and spend a reward all from your phone in a matter of seconds. You just scan the receipts. The process only takes a couple of seconds. You don't have to worry about where the receipt's from, what's on it, anything. You literally scan it and the app does everything else. And like we said before, your points will turn into gift cards from literally almost anywhere. And you can also earn points from anywhere, um, retail stores, Amazon purchases, restaurants, wherever you go. So you guys check out the link in the description, use the code husband and get 5,000 points when you scan your first receipt. Download the app now and use the code husband to get 5,000 points when you scan your first receipt. This is a limited time offer for our viewers. And again, you guys, this is free money. Scan your receipts from where you're already spending money and get points back. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to our podcast. This is Murder With My Husband. I'm Peyton Moreland. And I'm Garrett Moreland. And he's the husband. And I'm the husband. All right, you guys, we are so excited to announce that we are dropping our Halloween October spooky merch this week. So stay tuned. We designed it. It has everything to do with Halloween and you need to get it now so that you can wear it all of October. It'll be live at 10 a.m. on Tuesday, October 4th. We're super excited for the Halloween merch. You can match our set. And other than that, we don't really have any other announcements. Well, besides the fact that we totally skipped over, it's October. Oh, it is October. The best month of the whole freaking year. We just did a Patreon episode. So I got confused. Yeah. So we decorated our set. If you're on YouTube, you can see it's all spooked out now. This is literally my favorite month. So Peyton's family was in town and we went to, I don't know, what do you call them? Like it's like a little outdoor mall kind Outlets. of. We had just eaten at this cafe and my, I don't know, I have stomach issues. My stomach's just always hurting. And so we were walking around, we were shopping, everything was fine. And yeah, you know, had to go to the bathroom, took care of business, yada, yada, yada. No big deal. <laughs> happens. And then we were in, where were we again? I think like Adidas or in, uh, Under Armour. Under Armour. We were in Under Armour. My daddy was getting some socks. Peyton's dad was getting socks. Peyton was there. And then I, you know, just sometimes it just hits you and you got to go, you got to go. So I like... Did this not like, you know, the full on run, but the like fast walk, I like fast walk out of there with my butt clenched, <laughs> had to go to the bathroom. So I ran out, <laughs> took off to the bathroom again and you can tell the rest because. Well, right as he was taking off, the people who were standing behind us in line, his name was Nick and he listens to the podcast. And so Garrett went running and he was wanting to say hi to Garrett, but Garrett was like running out with the diarrhea. And so, <laughs> with the di okay. and so Nick's like, Oh, I listen to your podcast. So we talked for a bit and then he, I could tell he was bummed that you were gone, but I didn't want to tell him like, Oh, well, sorry. His, he's got to go to the bathroom. Yeah. His stomach's hurting. So Nick, if you're listening to this, Garrett says hello. So if you ever say hi to us, somewhere first of all always come say hi to us and second of all if you ever see me running away when you're trying to say hi to us most likely it's just because i'm going to the bathroom not because i don't want to talk to you <laughs> i promise this will not be the last time that this happens so on that note let's get into a case all right so our case sources are newyorkdailynews.com truecrimeedition.com derangedlacrimes.com calisphere.org thecursedpod.com thevintagewomanmagazine.com historichorrors.com tasteofhome.com google maps redfin ancestry.com and that's it 
So as we were talking about, it is October, which means big things for Murder With My Husband. Last year, we incorporated listener submitted spooky stories into our typical content, but this year we wanted to add another fun change. For the month of October leading up to Halloween, Murder With My Husband will be releasing all Halloween murder cases. These cases will have taken place on or be centered around Halloween. And then the last week of October, we are tackling a case that has interested me since I could remember. It is all things Halloween, and I really think you guys are going to love it. So sit back and relax as we do a serious Halloween dive for the next couple of weeks. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not going to be relaxing. Our first Halloween case actually takes place on Halloween back on October 31st, 1957. We are in Sun Valley, California, which is north of Los Angeles and north of Hollywood. I'm sure back in the late 50s, this part of California probably looked pretty different than it does today. Sun Valley is a suburb of Los Angeles and close to Burbank. And in this neighborhood in California, families are spending Halloween evening trick-or-treating, passing out candy, and attending costume parties. And it was no different for Peter and Betty Fabiano, a married couple in their mid-30s in the area. According to Redfin, the Fabiano couple lived in a four-bedroom, two-bathroom, one-story house. And if you look at Google Maps, you can see that the house is on a corner lot in the quiet neighborhood. Now, Peter and Betty spent Halloween night handing out candy to the trick-or-treaters in their Sun Valley neighborhood. Slowly, the knocks grow farther and farther apart as children made their way off the streets and into their respective homes to examine their earnings. I miss so bad laying all of my candy out after Halloween and picking through the ones I want to keep and want to throw away. It's such a fun tradition. I know. I can't do it anymore. People just think I'm weird if I go ask them. <laughs> for candy now you know well i'm pretty sure now we can just buy our own candy yeah but there's nothing like just getting candy for free well actually i do need to say my mom bought us a skeleton candy bowl and filled it up with a bunch of sour mm. candies for garrett it's true so garrett's been eating this sour candy that's sitting at our front door that was intended for halloween for the last two weeks. Yeah, ain't no kids getting candy from me. <laughs> <laughs> we already need to refill I'm it. I mean, all of it. So after a while, Peter and Betty locked the front door, turned down the house, and headed up to bed. Betty's daughter from a previous marriage named Judy is also asleep in the house at this point. Peter and Betty were home with Betty's two teenage children from a previous marriage, but this is the only time I've seen that mentioned okay. in one of the sources. So I... I know for sure it's Judy. Either way, there's at least one child in the home with Peter and Betty on this spooky night. Now, around 11 p.m., hours after the Fabiano's last trick-or-treater had come by, there was either a ring or a knock at the front door. Peter's eyes snapped open in their bedroom and questioned if he had really heard someone at the door. But then again, another knock or ring came. And this annoyed both Peter and Betty. I mean, I think the cardinal rule is that once a house has turned off the lights in the home, the mm -hmm. front porch lights, that means they are closed for business. There's yeah. no more trick-or-treating. So they're kind of like, what the heck? It's 11 p.m. Why is someone now coming trick-or-treating? But Peter reluctantly climbs out of bed and makes his way to the front door. Once there, he flips on the light, grabs the bowl of candy, and opens the door. Oh, no. From upstairs, Betty can hear all of this. She listens as Peter answers yes as he opens the door. Realizing it was another trick-or-treater, Betty hears Peter ask the knocker, isn't it a little late for this, as he goes to hand them the candy. Betty listens as whoever is at the front door answers Peter, but she couldn't quite make out what they said. All she knows is that the voice was awfully strange, almost like someone trying to disguise their voice or considering it's Halloween, maybe talking in character. But it was after this response that Betty heard a series of noises that startled her. Any sleepiness that had been lingering was immediately washed away. According to NewYorkDailyNews.com, quote, there was a pop, then a thump, then a screech as a car sped off into the night. Okay. Betty jumps out of bed and rushes towards the front door where she finds her husband, Peter, on the ground and bleeding profusely from a wound. Whoever had been standing on the front porch was now long gone. Betty quickly realizes at this point that the unknown trick-or-treater was probably not a trick-or-treater at all. Honestly, probably not even a child. Someone had obviously used the traditions of Halloween as a ruse, showed up in a costume successfully tricking Peter to open the door to a masked individual, 
and then shot him in the chest as he handed them candy. Oh my gosh. Peter was now lying on his back just inside of the front door, unconscious and bleeding out. Why? Unbeknownst to Betty at the time, Peter had a bullet lodged inside his chest right near his heart. Now, Betty's daughter, Judy, also heard the gunshot and had run to the front door as well. Betty remembers that just two doors down lives a neighbor named Bud Alper, who was a police officer with the LAPD. So she quickly sends her daughter, Judy, running over there for help. When Judy relays to Bud Alper what was going on, he calls the Valley Division of the LAPD, and officers arrive to the Fabiano home fairly quickly. Peter is rushed by ambulance to Sun Valley Hospital, but despite the efforts of everyone around, the wound had just been too severe. The bullet penetrating just right. Peter Fabiano is pronounced dead from blood loss at the hospital. That is insane. As everyone is trying to figure out what the freak had just happened, Betty Fabiano is in shock. Her husband went from laying in bed with her one minute to dying on their doorstep That's the next. That's horrible. Who had rang the doorbell that night? Who had shot her husband in the chest and took off? And why? Police are also wondering all of these same things. And so they have to begin their investigation by discovering who Betty and Peter Fabiano are. And if anyone in their life would have reason to do this. Peter Fabiano was only 35 years old at the time of his murder that Halloween night. I thought they were like 60, 70. I don't no, know why I thought they were older. Mid-30s. He was born in 1922 and had served in the U.S. Marines in World War II. In 1948, nine years before his murder, Peter had gotten into some trouble with the law just once. It was a charge related to bookmarking, but since then he had a clean record. Bookmarking. So I did look it up, and according to LACriminalDefense.com, California criminal attorneys explain bookmarking and wagering laws under Penal Code 337A, including related crimes of gambling fraud mm. and prostitution. Okay. So they don't specify... Bookmarking. That's interesting. I've never heard it. Me I mean, either. I'm sure that's the correct term for it, but I'd never heard that before. I'm also going to assume maybe it's a little outdated. Yeah. After this run-in with the law, Peter had continued on with life and become a successful business owner. Peter was a hairstylist back in the 1950s. He owned and operated two successful beauty salons in the San Fernando Valley. He eventually met Betty in the 1940s, and after getting married in New York in 1955, they moved to Los Angeles and into their Sun Valley home in 1956 and lived comfortably together with her child or children from a previous marriage. Now, Betty was 36 years old at the time of her husband's murder in 1957. She had two children from a previous marriage. There isn't much information about her, but she may have helped with her husband's salon business, and it is noted that she had reddish hair. I will say, back in the 1950s, it's probably common that a married mother would likely stay at home, so I'm not too surprised yeah. that you know, nothing much was listed besides her career as a mother. I couldn't find much information about her previous marriage or her children, you know, maybe how they split time between them and their father. Again, the kids nor their father are pertinent to Peter's murder. So that's probably why there's not information as well as this murder happened in the 1950s. So again, it's just kind of harder to find information. So back to the day after the murder, police search for witnesses to the attack, but can only find one, a 15 year old teenage boy who witnessed a car speeding away from the neighborhood the night before around 11 p.m. But even his story didn't help police much when it came to finding a suspect. They searched the front porch, the only known place the killer was that night, and discovered a disturbingly little amount of evidence. All the way down to the fact that there were no spent shell casings at the scene, which means the killer took them. The single shot execution made police question whether this could possibly be a gang style hit. The police follow up on this idea by investigating Peter Fabiano and his background, but it turns out to be a dead end theory. I'm actually surprised that he was only shot once. Right. And it killed him. Especially if you're, if that person was going there on the attempt to kill someone or to kill him. Which is what and, it seems like. And he just shoots once. That's, and that seems pretty risky. I mean, obviously the whole thing was risky, but I don't know. One one shot is interesting. I agree. All police could find on Peter was the one prior brush with the law that we talked about. He didn't have any ties to organized crime or criminal organizations. Police even interview people connected to the Fabianos, but that comes up with no leads as well. It seems like the only way police were going to find any clues in the investigation was to interview Betty and ask if she knew of 
anyone who would want to hurt her husband. And surprisingly, she did. Okay. According to TrueCrimeEdition.com, Betty tells police that, quote, Peter had one enemy and only one person who would want to hurt him. One of Betty's former friends, a woman named Joan Rebel. Based on this information, Joan is brought in and questioned by police in the murder of Peter Fabiano. According to reports, Joan is a bit of a mystery, but here's what we could gather. Some reports say she was born in 1917 in Philadelphia, while others say she was originally born in Lithuania and later came to the United States. How is there a discrepancy there? Because it's so, I mean, 1917. Yeah, I guess. That is so long ago. Mm -hmm. Joan had worked to some degree as a journalist, writer, and or photographer. She traveled to Hawaii to take classes and also went on selling trips where she would take photos as a freelance photographer. Photographer. And this is pretty crazy for the 40, like the 50s, the 40s yeah. and 50s. Joan had been married and divorced and was around 40 years old at the time of the murder. Joan started working at one of Peter Fabiano's beauty salons as a receptionist reportedly in early 1957, right around the time when she got divorced. Okay. Through Peter, Joan met and quickly became close friends with his wife, Betty, and she was almost immediately welcomed and included into the Fabiano family. But around this time, when she entered into Betty and Peter's life, the Fabianos were reportedly having trouble in their marriage. Betty had confided in Joan that Peter was abusive and controlling, and it's almost like the new friendship with Joan was turning into a place for Betty to escape from her marriage. She started spending a lot of time with Joan, complaining about Peter, and filling the void through Joan that she was missing from her own husband. Because of this, Joan and Betty's friendship began to become its own rock in the Fabiano's marriage. Peter feeling like Joan was pulling Betty away from him and encouraging all of her fears about their marriage. So think two girlfriends, he starts to not like the girlfriend because he feels like she's pulling him away from her when she says, oh, I don't like him, the girlfriend says, yeah, neither do I, type thing. So how was Betty right now? Is she devastated that her husband's dead? Yes. Okay. Yes. I mean, uh, uh, based on what police are saying, she's acting like a grieving Like wife. she's actually grieving. Okay. I yes. just didn't know if she was not grieving or right. happy or whatever it may be. It was in early 1957 that Joan persuaded Betty to leave her husband, take some time away, and just move in with her for the time being. Things had gotten so bad that Betty was going to leave and move in with Joan. Now, according to the older sources, the relationship of Betty and Joan at this time was then described as, quote, abnormal, which many believe was code for homosexual. It was pretty known that despite the fact that Joan was constantly agreeing with Betty that her marriage to Peter was crap, they were also becoming romantically involved together. Okay. So essentially, Betty had started an affair with Peter's front desk receptionist, Joan, and had now moved out of their house and into hers. But it was short-lived. According to friends, Betty eventually decided that although she had fun with Joan, it was time to return home to her husband, Peter, and continue on with life. Mm. Betty told her girlfriend, Joan, that not only was their relationship over, she believed in her marriage to Peter and that it was worth saving and she was going to move back home and continue in with it. The couple reconciled and Betty agreed not to see Joan again. But for Peter, it needed to be even more than that. He demanded that not only would Betty never see Joan again, she was never to even speak her name again. So Betty is forced to cut Joan off entirely. And Joan is also fired from working at Peter's salon. I mean, it's fine. I get it. But I'm just not sure at what point speaking the name now becomes like so well, important you know what i'm saying why don't you call jk rowling and say that about lord voldemort then <laughs> yeah true good point <laughs> so joan's whole entire life is basically turned upside down because she now has her friend turned girlfriend mm-hmm. breaking up with her she's been fired from her job and she's been cut out of the fabiano's life completely this is all pretty soon after she just got divorced yeah. so if this doesn't scream some type of motive, then I don't know what does. We have a love triangle. We have a split. The person picks the other person. I mean, this is pretty common for the cases we cover. Now, despite everything I just told you about Joan, when she is brought in by police after Peter's murder, she mentions none of this and exclaims her innocence. I just feel like usually in love triangles, 
there's like usually some sort of pact. For example, Betty and Joan would have a pact like, oh, if we kill him, then we're going to be together still. Right. So, but here, I mean, if she's actually grieving, like you said, so it doesn't seem like there's a pact going on. So, okay, so there's two options, right? There's the Betty and Joan have made a pact to kill Betty's husband and run off together. That's a common love triangle. Or she just killed them. Or Joan is so mad and upset yes. that Betty broke up with her and went back to Peter that she killed him on her own. So Joan tells police that her and the Fabianos are dear friends, that she's heartbroken by the news and claims she has an alibi for the night of the murder. She tells police that she was home all night on Halloween and points to the fact that her car sat outside in her driveway the whole evening. Just go ask her neighbors. She's already lying. They're, she's not dear friends with the Fabianos. We're correct. They hate her. Right. And now she's saying, oh, no, I was home all evening. My car sat in the driveway. Go ask my neighbors. And police are like, bet we will go ask your neighbors. Yeah, yeah. And they do. And every single neighbor explains to police that Joan is telling the truth. Anyone who happened to glance at Joan's house on Halloween noticed the lights were on and her car was in the driveway. It did not move. So about to give up on this pretty good theory, police interview one last person in Joan's life. This somehow ignites the fire of her involvement once again. Her name is Margaret Barrett. When police ask the routine questions to Margaret about Joan, they get the same answers as everyone else, except one minor thing. Margaret tells police that, yeah, Joan's car did stay in her driveway the entire evening on Halloween, but that wasn't because she was home. Joan's car didn't move from her own driveway the night Peter was murdered because Joan had asked to borrow Margaret's car for the night. Okay, here we go. So police are like, what? Joan claimed her car was her alibi, and now Margaret has busted that alibi wide open. Margaret explains that Joan asked her if she could borrow her car for a trip to the grocery store on Halloween. And although Margaret was kind of confused, like Joan has her own car, she agreed. I mean, what do you do for a friend, you know? According to historichorse.com, Margaret tells police that Joan put 37 miles on her car Halloween night, which she thought was weird. That's a lot. That's a lot. A lot. All of this... After she told police she never left her house. So police realize that there are way closer grocery stores to Joan's house than 37 miles away. But you know whose house was roughly 12 to 14 miles away from Joan's? The Fabiano's house. Making the, that round trip, if she were to have driven there and back, roughly 28 miles with maybe a stop or two in between. So locked and loaded with this new information that just put a gaping hole in Joan's already shaky story, police confront her with the news. When this happens, Joan realizes she's been caught in her lie and she confesses to police. All right. All right. So I did borrow my neighbor Margaret's car, but it really was just to go to the grocery store. Police are like, it took you 37 miles to get to the grocery store. And Joan says, well, yeah, I went to my favorite one. OK, if this is true, why not take your own car and why lie to us about yep. it? Joan does not have a sensible answer. Police at this point are like, be for real, Joan. Come on, like, be for real. This doesn't make sense. Your story isn't making sense. And we believe because of the past history you have with Peter and Betty, your bitterness and anger led you to the Fabiano's house that night where you dressed up unrecognizable, taking advantage of a very good holiday and shot Peter, your enemy, in the chest. But Joan will not fold. She claims... No, none of this is true. I, I didn't have a problem with Peter. I had nothing to do with his murder. I did not pull the trigger and I do not know who did. And although police do not believe her for one second, they have no physical or forensic evidence to prove Joan was the one who killed Peter. So sadly, they have to let her go. And time begins to pass with nothing else surfacing in the case. Again, it's a situation where police truly believe they have the right suspect, but they can't do anything about it. Especially in the 50s. Right. I mean, technology has advanced so much since the 50s. I feel like it would be really hard to catch someone if you don't have any of that stuff. Right. It's been about a month since Peter was tragically murdered by an intruder on the front doorstep of his own home. Police believe Joan is their suspect, but can't seem to find the evidence to arrest her for it. That was until November, 
when an anonymous tip came into police that breaks the case. Someone calls in and claims that the gun or murder weapon used in Peter Fabiano's murder is hidden in a rental locker at a department store in downtown Los Angeles. Why in the world would you hide it there? What are you thinking? <laughs> Reportedly, this store was called Bullocks. And according to the VintageWomanMagazine.com, this Bullocks was right across the street from a well-known Clifton's cafeteria. Now, to avoid another Menard situation, I looked it up and Bullock's was just your average department store that is no longer in business. But many of their locations have been converted into Macy's department store since. Okay. Despite the randomness of this tip, police decide to follow up on it. And sure enough, they find the gun in the rental no locker way. at Bullock's. The gun was loaded with just one bullet still in it. The police immediately run ballistic tests on the gun and determined that it was indeed the murder weapon that fired the fatal shot into Peter Fabiano back on Halloween night. Now the police have the gun, a 38 revolver. They track records to see who the gun belonged to. They are hoping that this gun somehow can tie them back to Joan and they can close this case. Oh, no. According to NewYorkDailyNews.com, a scan of sales records of the gun shops in the area led to the owner, a woman named Goldine Pitzer, a 40-year-old huh. laboratory technician at Los Angeles Children's Hospital. Interesting. I thought it was going to... Okay. I thought it was going to lead back to the husband for a second. To Peter, his yes. own gun? I, I don't know. Maybe. I thought it was going to be something weird like well, that. Well, now... Who is Goldeen? Yeah. Also, can we just say Goldeen is like a really just the cool name. name? Yeah. So despite not knowing who she is or how she's even connected to the case, police have solid evidence now. They go to Goldeen's home in West Hollywood and arrest her and bring her in. And to their surprise, Goldeen breaks down easily and literally confesses to the murder. Like the second they bring her in, she's like, yeah, 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 I killed Peter. What? She tells police that a friend of hers, they might know her, Joan, had talked her into committing the crime no, for her. No, wait, so then why did she leave the house? Right, right, that we'll get there. doesn't make any sense, okay. We'll get there. So Goldine was reportedly 43 years old at the time of Peter's murder. She was working as a medical secretary at the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. The daughter of a furniture store owner, she graduated from Los Angeles High School in 1943 and apparently married a decade later, but was either divorced or widowed when she met Joan. Now, Joan and Goldine lived just one mile away from each other near the Sunset Strip, and they had met way before Joan ever met the Fabianos, okay. a couple years before. According to TrueCrimeEdition.com, Goldine was also into women, but she had spent most of her life hiding or surprising suppressing it given the times and the danger in coming out and although they had known each other for years goldine and joan had become extremely close ever since betty broke it off with joan and was shut out of her life how do you convince someone to murder someone I, we'll get there like how's that even possible goldine and joan have been friends for years mm -hmm. in the middle of their friendship that was just purely a friendship joan meets the fabianos meets betty and then has the whole affair with betty betty then breaks up with joan and moves back in with peter after this joan starts hanging out with goldine a little bit more their yeah. friendship becomes a little bit stronger so this is what goldine tells police when they arrest her be basically because her gun was involved in peter's murder Joan and Goldine were friends who liked to spend time together having morning coffee and talking and gossiping. Goldine and Joan had a lot in common and they enjoyed their coffee talks. Both had been recently divorced and both had experience hiding their sexual identities. Back in 1957, being gay wasn't accepted and was even criminalized in some locations. According to the VintageWomanMagazine.com, in 1957, Joan described her relationship to the Valley Times newspaper as, quote, coffee clatch friends. Now, a coffee clatch is a term and activity that was very popular in the 1950s. According to tasteofhome.com, it derives from the German word coffee clatch, which means coffee and gossip. Now, coffee clatches were popular, like I said, in the 1950s when it was common for women to stay home with the kids. Ladies would then get together with neighbors and discuss the latest uh, updates in everyone's life and gossip, hence 
coffee clutching. And this is what Goldine and Joan's relationship started as. Now, one day during their morning coffee, Joan complains to Goldine about Peter, her boss at the salon. According to New York Daily News, quote, in those months, Joan's major topic of conversation was Peter Fabiano. She called him a uh, evil and vile man who was destroying everything around him and that she wanted revenge against him. Which is so interesting that she's saying her boss. Right. Instead of her girlfriend's husband. Yeah. Which, I mean, I guess that's not that interesting because it would be kind of weird to say my girlfriend's husband. Right. So Goldine believed her friend and grew to hate Fabiano as well. I mean, the way that Joan was describing him to Goldine made her think he was just possibly the worst man on the planet. Joan said to Goldine that he mistreated his wife and that he was dealing in narcotics. Um, She said that he was abusing her at home. Basically, Joan convinces Goldine that this man is just not a good man. Goldeen claimed hour after hour, Joan would rail about her rival's evil nature and his cruelty to his wife and children. And within two months, Goldeen was certain Peter was just a monster, one that had to be destroyed. She says, Joan and I discussed killing Peter many times. Oh my gosh. She said, we were undecided whether we should use poison, a knife, or a gun. That's just insane. Well, according to Goldeen, Joan used her coffee clutch time with her to develop a hatred toward Peter Fabiano and to quote groom her for murder. Goldine explains to police that during these couple months, Joan seduced her and began a relationship with her, making her believe it was completely real. Almost like she put her under a spell. She thinks she knows now that the only reason Joan began the relationship was to convince her to kill Peter for her, was to manipulate her, but she didn't know that then. Goldine tells police that in the thick of it, she would have done anything for Joan, believing that they were really in love and soulmates. It's clear to police that Joan appears to be the dominant in the relationship and the brains behind the whole murder plan. But she was telling the truth when she told police she didn't pull the trigger because even Goldine admits she herself had done that. And because Joan didn't pull the trigger, she's not going to be nearly in trouble as Goldine is. Correct. I mean, that's what it seems like, right? That sucks. I'm a kid. Doesn't suck because they both killed someone. In my eyes, at least. But police are aware that like Goldine never would have killed Peter without Joan. Yeah. So Goldine's talking to police and she says together her and Joan had decided on a gun. In order to carry out the murder, Goldine went to a gun store in Pasadena and bought a 38 Special Smith & Wesson revolver. She pretended that the purchase was for self-defense. Joan gave Goldine the money for the gun. So it was both of them in on it. According to derangedlacrimes.com, Joan drove Goldine back to the gun shop a couple of days after the purchase to actually pick it up with two bullets in it that they paid for. Joan paid for the gun, like I said, and Goldine held on to it for Halloween night. Why just two bullets? I don't know. I don't know why. I think that only two came with it and they just decided not to buy more ammo, which might go back to your question of why there was only one shot fired. (laughs) That's okay. So Joan decided that Halloween would be the best time to commit the murder. Quote, a time when a person running around the streets in a disguise would not raise an eyebrow. Which again, taking advantage of a good holiday. In order to make sure that Goldine would recognize Peter and shoot the right person, Joan actually took her to Peter's beauty salon in October to point out who he was and make sure she would kill the right person. And then on Halloween night, Joan borrowed a car from her friend, Margaret Barrett. Joan used the car to drive to Goldine's house. According to derangedlacrimes.com, quote, Joan came over to my house with some clothing, blue jeans, khaki jackets, hats, eye masks, makeup, and red gloves. We dressed up, got in the borrowed car, and drove to Fabiano's home, arriving there about 9 p.m. Together at this point, Goldine and Joan, now lovers, sit outside the Fabiano home waiting for the lights to go out. That's so Both freaky. knowing what they were about to do. They sat there for two hours hours holy crap they put the gun in a paper bag this bag wouldn't alarm peter because it was like the bags the trick-or-treaters carry around but instead of candy it held a gun goldine put on her mask walked to the front door and rang the doorbell twice peter fabiano annoyedly opened the door goldine claimed she was trembling so hard she could barely hold the gun 
After firing with dead on accuracy, Goldine ran back to the getaway car where Joan was waiting. Joan then returned the car back to Margaret's house and that left Joan and Goldine alone again, want, you know, just needing to go their separate ways. Now, Goldine claims to police this was the first time that Joan became cold and different towards her. Joan looked at Goldine, who had just murdered her enemy for her and said, quote, forget you ever knew me, then turned around and walked away. It's hard for me not to feel bad for Goldine, but she killed someone. So I'm trying not to feel bad for her. Well, because I think it just shows that people can be easy, easily manipulated. And I also think there's that extra, so. there's that extra thing in this case where Goldine was not able to live her true life. She was not able to love who she wanted to love because quite literally it could have been illegal at this point. And so she finally finds a woman who she thinks can love her, that she can finally have this relationship she's wanted her whole life and she's nuts. just for it to be fake, just for it to be fake. But again, I don't want to empathize with her because yeah, she murdered. Yeah, she killed. She someone. murdered. For she knew someone. what she was doing. So it's right. Like, I can't it's wrong. Feel bad for her. It's 100 yeah. percent wrong. So after hearing Goldine's confession, the police bring Joan back to the police station. Apparently, they have her listen in as Goldine gives her full confession for the second time. Joan has not much to say after that. The two are indicted for murder by a county grand jury. Goldine testifies before the grand jury and says that Joan got her to commit the murder by portraying Peter as a symbol of evil. Goldine didn't even know Peter. She had never met Peter. Mm -hmm. Joan did not testify before the grand jury. On March 11th, 1958, both Joan and Goldine pled guilty to second degree murder. Oh, so she got second degree murder as well? I don't know why this isn't first degree murder. I don't know what happened here. Again, it was so long ago. It was the it was 58. No, but I'm surprised that Joan also got second degree murder. I thought she would have gotten like cons conspired to murder. Conspiracy to conspiracy commit murder. To commit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they, they just figured like because Joan was the connection and not Goldine that she had a bigger part in the murder than they were. Interesting. Thinking. So they are both sentenced to a term of five years to life in prison. What? So according to the New York Daily News, that deal that they got for, for pleading guilty sparked a public outcry viewed as being too soft on a killer. But Goldine was so pathetic that it seemed unlikely a jury would send her to the gas chamber, even though she confessed to killing a stranger in cold blood. And if the killer skirted justice, it would be literally impossible to get the accomplice convicted. So the sources aren't clear as how long the two women actually served in prison, but they both did get out and continue on with life. Okay. Like there was not much justice here. Betty Fabiano sold her late husband's salons. One source says she never married again, while another says she remarried in 1966, nine years after Peter was murdered. She died in 1999 in Palm Desert, California at the age of 81. Wow. There continue to be rumors and questions to this day as to exactly what the relationship was between Betty and Joan that sparked this whole murder and whether Betty had anything to do with the murder plot. But these are rumors in several sources, and I haven't found any evidence evidence to suggest that Betty was actually involved in the murder in any way. So I'm not going to sit here and be like, well, she might have been. Yeah. The common theory is that Joan's jealousy of Peter was the motive for the crime. And that's literally what got him killed. And that is the story of Peter Fabiano, the trick or treat murder. So something I feel like I do now is whenever someone rings or knocks on the door, I always look through the little people. Always. Always. I used to not. I used to just open it wide open. And now... Because of this podcast, I am paranoid and I think everyone's trying to kill me. So I always lo look through little people. Except what's one night of the year that you wouldn't check it every single time? Halloween. Halloween. And even if you did check it, if someone was dressed up holding a bag, you would think they're trick or treating. If it was 11 o'clock at night, I do wonder if my mind would change. Well, okay. So this is what I was thinking. I'm not, uh, not blaming though. I'm just saying... If it were to happen to me now, right? I do wonder how I was, I'd react. I was thinking that because if me and you were in bed, say we just got done passing out candy, and I think we would have just said, eh, yeah. let him go to the next Pretend house. we're not home. But I'm maybe that, sleep. I think that's also just like a more common thing that people do. Yeah. Um, I think people used to be a little bit more polite in that in totally. that manner you know they uh -huh. would always get up and answer their door now people just ignore the door yeah all right you guys i was not kidding when i say october is a big month for murder with my husband we have two announcements coming up we have merch dropping next week and we have halloween themed cases for the entire month so stay tuned it's going to be a good one and we will see you guys next week with another episode i love it and i hate it goodbye